Good morning. That's kind of loud. Um, Walter's presentation sort of uh, talks a little bit about uh, privacy, and that's going to be part of what I'm talking about with respect to the ethical issues that we deal with when we talk about electronic medical records. So technology and medicine, the use of the electronic health record. My objectives today are to understand the advantages and disadvantages of using an electronic health record, to become aware of some of the ethical issues that are posed by the use of an electronic health record, to understand e-prescribing, and also there's a, I'm going to talk about an introduction to the Medicare, Medicaid, and the e-prescribe and standard programs that CMS has made available to us as providers. Uh, it's not going to be inclusive, and uh, there has been some changes in what, we've, what they've dis described as what we need to qualify for meaningful use to get some of these incentive programs, and we'll just touch on that but give you some websites to use if you're interested in delving into it further. The electronic medical record and the electronic health record are sometimes used uh, interchangeably, but they are somewhat different. The electronic medical record is a digital version of the paper chart. It contains medical and treatment history of the patient. The advantages of using that an electronic medical record over a paper record is it allows us to track data over time, to easily identify patients that are required for a preventative screening, for us to follow parameters such as blood pressure and vaccinations, and allows us to monitor and improve the quality of care of our patients. Disadvantages of a record is that, of an electronic medical record, is that the information does not travel easily outside of the practice. And that's the difference, the basic difference between that and electronic health record. The electronic health record does what the electronic medical record does, but it also does more. It focuses on the total health of the patient, and it gives us a broader view of the patient, including his or her care. Allows us to share the information between practices, and for instance, giving, getting laboratory information to the lab, also sharing our information with consultants and specialists. And that's the difference between the electronic medical record and the health record, is that the health record allows us to do other things. In order to qualify for meaningful use, we have to have a health record, not just a medical record. Uh, the electronic health record allows us to create data, manage it, and as allows us to be consulted by authorized clinicians across more than just one healthcare organization. Benefits of an electronic health record, we are allowed better to coordinate care. ER physicians can access patients' allergies. Patients can log on to their own records. Lab results are available to specialists. Discharge summaries are available to our consultants. The electronic health record uses less storage space than a paper chart. Information is more easily transferable. Because uh, many of us who are physicians have illegible writing, it causes less errors. I was, I'm part of one of those. And it allows us to have information more readily available. When the information is legible, it makes, us, makes it easier to defend if in a malpractice claim. Things are, if you can't read it, then it's not there. Disadvantages of an electronic health record, there are some concerns about privacy. Um, Walter alluded to all the different ways people can kind of access and destroy privacy when it comes to the, our electronic age. The costs can be prohibitive. Um, I'm actually in currently trying to uh, I'm thinking about changing my electronic health record that I'm using, and the one I'm using is about $200 a month. The one that they want to sell me is about $700 a month, including the upfront cost of between five dollars and $10,000. So that, that cost can be disadvantaged, but they are, there are a number of electronic health records. I think there are about 100 different ones that you're able to purchase. Some of them are free, and of course, not all of them are certified. In order to qualify for meaningful use and to get the incentive payments, you have to have a certified electronic health record. Other disadvantages are technology is not perfect. Uh, I think Walter alluded to that too. Another thing is people make mistakes. Uh, most of the electronic health records have uh, 
programs that have drop down boxes, if you happen to click on the wrong box, that information could end up in a record and it can be totally wrong, especially if, the, if in the summary it did not show up properly. The uh, health, health records that are available are not standardized and data may not always be secure, but part of the meaningful use that's required is that you, you get a certified program, certified uh, system that does have privacy. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs. In order to qualify for either the Medicare or Medicaid incentive program, you have to have an electronic health record that is certified. You have to be assured that the system has the necessary technological capabilities, the functionality, and the security in order to be certified. It has to be secure. It must also be able to share with other systems that are also secure. The Medicare incentive program, and if, if you decide to participate in a Medicare incentive program, you can't participate in the Medicaid incentive program. Um, you can choose either or, but you can't do both. Uh, if you're an eligible professional, a hospital, or a critical access hospital, you have to meet meaningful use in order to qualify for the incentive. The providers in those incentives, each provider can receive up to $44,000 over a five-year span uh, if they meet the meaningful use and have a certified plan. There are additional incentives that are available through CMS if you are providing services in a health professional shortage area. If you have not, if you participate in Medicare and you have not started using an electronic health record that's certified, penalties will start being assessed by CMS to people that are, that are taking Medicare patients. And that starts in the year 2015. The Medicaid uh, incentive program is voluntary, voluntarily offered by individual states. The eligible professionals that take part in that can receive up to $63,000, $750 over a six-year period. There is also incentives to do e-prescriptions. Uh, if you decide to do either Medicare or Medicaid, you can't do both of them, but you can do e-prescribe whether you use either of those uh, in initially. So if, you have, if you're doing e-prescriptions, and most of the certified, part of having a certified electronic health record is that it has to be able to do e-prescriptions. And basically, e-prescriptions are prescriptions that are sent by email. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple of years, and it's one of the things that I've found that's been very helpful uh, in this electronic age because of the problems with patients losing prescriptions and the pharmacists not being able to read my, my, uh, my writing. And that, that's happened not infrequently, but I don't get any more calls about what, was, what that was or what the dosage was. Um, so it, the legibility thing is, is a good thing that e-prescriptions has gotten rid of. It also allows us to reduce adverse reactions um, because if it's in an electronic record, it will, also, it will also key you to when there are contraindications to uh, a particular medicine being on a patient or if the patient's on another medicine that you may not know about because they went to a consultant about drug interactions. Uh, E-prescribes, E-prescriptions may allow the patients to actually save some money because in the electronic health record there can be formularies that uh, will uh, note you, alert you to the fact that if you prescribe this particular medicine there are formulary alternatives and that can reduce the copayment that the, the patient has. MIPA, which is Medicine Improvements for Patients and Providers Act of 2008, has a five-year program of incentive payments for, for providers who do e-prescriptions. There's a 1% incentive that's available this year, and for eligible professionals who fail to do e-prescriptions, there's a 1% penalty that also starts this year. It, we are, it is available for us to do e-prescriptions for controlled substances. In June of 2010, Schedule two through four controlled substances c 
could be done if you had a two-factor authentication credential done or a digital certificate through a federally appointed credential service provider. My experience with this is if it's something that requires a written prescription, you have to, you know, your electronic health record can print the prescription, but you still have to print it out and give it to the patient. The things that, uh, that you can call in, most of the time the, pr the uh, pharmacist will take those. There are some pharmacists, some of the chains have called me back when I prescribed Tylenol number three, for instance, uh, saying that I could not e-prescribe that. Of course, you can call it in, so when they call me, I just tell them that it's okay to go ahead and give it, so it doesn't really change that much. In order to avoid penalties uh, for e-prescriptions, there's a 1.5% Medicare payment reduction based on the 2013 Medicare Part B payments that you can avoid if you use a G code. The G code is G8553, at least 10 times between January of this year and June 30th. So we just got another couple of months to go. And you only have to do it 10 times to avoid that penalty. In 2014, to avoid the same penalty, you have to use the same code 25 times this year or 10 times in the first six months of 2013. There are some exemptions to the e-prescription penalties. If you're in a state or if there are state, local, or federal regulations against using e-prescriptions, then you don't get the penalty. If you write less than 100 prescriptions, in the six months of the uh, first part of this year, then you're, not, you do, you're exempt from the penalty. If you're located in a remote area that does not have access to uh, high-speed internet, then you're exempt. Or if you're located in an area that, in where the pharmacy doesn't take e-prescriptions, then you're exempt. You may have to uh, send a letter to CMS in order to, to uh, initiate that exemption uh, because they may not know. Uh, these are two websites that you can use if you're interested in learning about the incentive program for e-prescribing. cms.gov slash e-prescription incentive and cms.gov slash pqrs. I'm going to briefly touch on the summary, uh, summary of the meaningful use uh, objectives for the eligible professionals in order to qualify for these incentives. They're both core and menu objectives. Uh, their stage one is passed as another stage two where they have changed the requirements. I'm not really going to talk about that, but uh, the, the core objectives involve the electronic health record has to have patient demographics. You must be able to record vital signs and chart changes. You must be able to maintain an up-to-date problem list of both current and active diagnoses. You must maintain an active medication list and an active allergy list. You must be able to record smoking history and status of patients older than 13 years of age and provide clinical summaries for each office visit uh, and make them available to the patient. You must be able to generate and transmit permissible prescriptions electronically in order to qualify for meaningful use. You must also practice computerized physician order entry. And this is mostly uh, true for uh, the patients in the hospital. Recently in our hospital, we've, uh, in the last two years, we've added an electronic uh, health record in the form of CERNA. And part of the meaningful use for that is establishing com computer physician order entry, which has been a challenge. Most of the older physicians have kind of balked on that. I've had a few tell me that if they, when, when it becomes mandatory, which it hasn't, I think it's going to become mandatory in October, that they were talking about retiring because they don't want to do it. Um, I started using the electronic, uh, using the progress notes as part of it uh, several months ago and found it useful when you could copy your previous note to the new note so that you, all you had to do was make changes. If When you do the first note, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, or it's time consuming to do it, but after that it became easier. The com computer physician order entry, though, can sometimes be challenging. Um, example, I, I um, had a, I wanted to write a prescription for an IV fluid and wanted normal saline. 
after a half an hour of trying to write that, I, f I finally wrote the order, because we can still write the order. I wrote it, and it took five seconds. Later, I found out that uh, in order to write that order, all I had to do was write sodium chloride, NaCl, and a whole list of IV fluids would come up. So those are the kinds of things that slow you down, and of course, it makes it kind of difficult for some people to do it. One of the things that this particular EHR has in it that's sort of helpful is that you can do favorites. So once, and you know, we're all creatures of habit, so once you establish that you, uh, a lot of orders that we write are similar, you can put in your favorites and then go to that, and it makes it a lot easier to write. So I, I'm, I'm getting better at it, but it, it's still a challenge. So another uh, uh, requirement for meaningful use is that we have to impl implement drug-to-drug -drug and drug allergies interaction checks in the electronic health record. You must be able to implement electronic exchange, ex electronically exchange clinical inform information among providers and patient authorized entities. We must be able to implement one clinical decision support rule and uh, have the ability to track that compliance with that rule in the system. We must be able to implement systems to protect privacy and the security of the patient data in the electronic health record. And we all must be able to report clinical quality measures to CMS or to states if they require it. The menu set of uh, requirements in order to meet uh, qualify for meaningful use is that you have to be able to implement, implement a drug formulary checks on uh, patients that have uh, have formularies in their in their insurance package. You must be able to incorporate clinical laboratory test results into the EHRs as structured data. Uh, that's one of the that's one of the reasons I'm having problems with my particular electronic record that I'm using is um, it was, I purchased it from the lab that I was using. Then I got a better lab deal, so I changed labs. When the, the lab that I was using, which was Quest, and their EHR is called uh, Care360, and I actually liked the, that. And of course, the labs that are sent to me go directly into the chart when I was using Quest. When I switched to Millennium, I had to scan those into the record. So if you scan, labs into the record, it does not enter, get entered as structured data, so I don't have the ability to capture it back, for instance, to, to say do, uh, uh, to see what my average A1C on my patients were, or even to see the blood pressures. So that, that's a problem in, that I have to try to remedy in either changing or getting them to interface with the new lab. One of the problems I had with, one of the problems with that was that since Quest had the EHR, they didn't really want me to be able to let some other lab put their information in. So you have to think about that when you're purchasing an electronic health record. You must be able to generate lists of patients by specific conditions to use for quality improvement and for reduction in disparities, for research or for outreach. You must be able to use the electronic health record technology to identify patients that require specific education resources and provide those to the patient when appropriate. You must be able to perform medication reconciliation between care settings. This is pretty much pointed out pretty well at my hospital. The, when the patients come to the emergency room, the, it's, it's behooves the nurse to write down all of their medications and put it in a reconciliation form so that we can fill it out and sign it depending on whether we want to continue them, continue them on the medication or not. Unfortunately, what ends up happening in the emergency room is, if, especially if the patient is a frequent flyer, the record will already be in there, and the nurse will just copy it from the previous record. That's not necessarily always accurate. Uh, an example of that is some of my nursing home patients, when they come to the ER, they always come with an MAR, which is a list of all the medications that they're on. If they copy from a previous ER visit, the old record, it may not be the same as what they're on now. And frequently that will mess you up when you try to discharge them from the hospital because you, you have to do a medic medication reconciliation form when they get discharged. And if it's not accurate, that makes it difficult to be accurate and help. The whole idea behind this was to be more accurate and cause less errors. 
but if, if you don't do it properly, then you don't end up doing that. So you also have to be able to provide a summary of the care record of patients referred or transitioned to another provider or setting and be able to submit electronic immunization data to immunization registries or immunization information systems like the health department. You must be able to submit electronic syndromic surveillance data to public health agencies and be able to send reminders to patients per their preference for preventative and follow-up care. And also we have to be able to provide the patients with timely electronic access to their own health information. Another thing that's going to be required for meaningful use and for us to qualify for meaningful use is that we have to have be able to exchange the information between agencies. Uh, health information exchange is what that's called. There is one in South Carolina called SkyAx or South Carolina Health Information Exchange. It is available currently. As far as I understand, it's free to people who apply. You do, there are forms you have to fill out. Right now it's free. At some time it is, it is going to be, uh, there will be a charge for it. And it allows us then to share electronic medical information between hospitals, doctors, consultants, and other health care providers. And it allows doctors to share their health facts through their electronic health record and an important thing about this is that patients can opt out. Now, what I, this is pretty much my talk, what I, what I try to do is explain to you the difference between what an electronic medical record is and what an electronic health record is. Then we, I tried to talk a little bit about what, it, what was required to uh, do meaningful use and what the, the, there was a menu set and uh, the, op uh, the, the uh, options that you have to have in order to qualify for meaningful use. And I also talked about the incentive programs that they have in order for us to qualify for and help us pay for these electronic health records.